Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me on the first ever Livestock Extension Group Virtual Field Day. This field day program has been brought to you by the University of Hawaii at Manoa Cooperative Extension Service. My name is Savannah Kotulski and I am the Kauai County Livestock Extension Agent. And the topic of this presentation is going to be discussing copper and beef cattle diets. Some of the information I'm going to go over might reiterate the presentation that Mark Thor did on mineral requirements for beef cattle, but I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the intricacies of copper and why it is such a challenging micro mineral here in Hawaii. When discussing mineral nutrition of livestock, we typically divide minerals into two classifications, macro and micro minerals. Macro minerals are minerals that are needed in higher quantities in the diet and are often reported as a percentage of the diet. Examples of macro minerals consist of calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, sulfur, and sodium chloride. Microminerals, on the other hand, are needed in smaller or trace quantities of the diet, which is why they are commonly referred to as trace minerals. These are often reported as PPM or parts per million in forage analyses, feed tags, or on mineral bags or tubs. Minerals in this classification, the trace minerals, include chromium, cobalt, copper, iodine, manganese, molybdenum, selenium, and zinc. Now. Don't let their names fool you. Just like protein and energy, minerals, no matter if they're considered a macro or micro mineral, must be balanced in a diet. A shortage of any of these minerals can limit animal productivity and result in an inefficient cow herd. Just like you would make sure there is enough protein in your forages, you must make sure your cattle are consuming sufficient amounts of minerals in order to capitalize on their productivity potential. Minerals are provided to cattle in a variety of methods. Typically, the feed or forage, in the case of most cattle producers in Hawaii, is the first source of mineral for cattle. The grasses or legumes in your pastures are the first thing a producer should look at when determining mineral levels in the diet. In terms of mineral supplements, there are many products available, which can be slightly overwhelming. The most common method is loose or bag mineral, such as the Purina bag picture here. The Hawaii mineral mix is the most common loose mineral that I have observed being used on many operations in the state, although you can work with companies in order to develop a custom blend. Other delivery methods include trace mineral blocks, which contain no macro minerals and only contain trace minerals, or molasses based blocks, which are growing in popularity across the country. These products are easier to use. However, one comment I would make is that when it comes to molasses blocks is that many of them are also used as a protein block, which is the most expensive form of protein you can provide to your herd. Be sure to pencil it out and make sure that these products work for your operation from a financial and feasibility standpoint. There are many companies which manufacture molasses-based blocks that are strictly mineral supplements without the added protein, and those products might be a good fit for your operation. Copper deficiency in Hawaii is quite common and all over the U.S., and I suspect that this is likely the largest mineral deficiency on ranches in Hawaii. There are others that are observed, however, we will focus on copper in this presentation. These two photos are classic examples of copper deficiency. Oftentimes, the first sign of copper deficiency you will see in your cattle is a discoloration of the coat. It often looks like sun bleaching, and most times this is due to a deficiency in copper. These two photos represent the same animal. The one on the left has discolored, missing patchy and rough hair, and is copper deficient. The photo on the right is the same cow after copper treatment, and as you can see, the hair is shinier, it has grown back, and overall the cow looks healthier. Although don't judge her based on her frame, this is clearly an example of an older style cow. The role of copper in basic body function in cattle is extensive, and we won't get into everything in this particular presentation, but there are a few things that are important to note. There are many copper-containing and copper-dependent enzymes, and the functions of these enzymes include cellular function, neural transmission, and antioxidation. 
There are many other enzymes that either contain copper or require copper in order to facilitate their function. Copper is also important in cardiovascular function due to its role in connective tissue metabolism and cardiac failure has been reported to be caused from extreme copper deficiency. This was historically referred to as falling disease, where cattle in New Zealand were dropping dead out of nowhere in pastures due to ruptures in their aortas. Further inspection indicated these cows were actually in fact extremely copper deficient and therefore unable to maintain the integrity of the blood vessels in their heart tissue. Similarly, bone formation requires adequate copper level, mostly due to its role in tissue and bone meta metabolism. Copper and iron have more of a love-hate relationship. Copper is necessary for iron absorption, and animals that are deficient in copper will eventually become anemic. However, high levels of iron in the diet can inhibit copper from being properly absorbed by the animal, and therefore these two minerals must maintain a delicate balance. Their roles in the body are so intricate. Now, all of this is well and good, but let's be honest, if you're in the cow-calf business, reproduction and immunity are likely big priorities for you, and maintaining cows with reproductive success and calves with sufficient immune systems is imperative. And we are going to discuss those a little further in the next slides. This slide is a summary of a survey where blood samples were taken from 318 cows. It was noted which cows aborted their calves and which had a calf on the ground and compared this to their copper status. From there, they collected blood and liver samples from these cows in order to evaluate their copper status. Of the cows which aborted calves, just over 87% of them were copper deficient, whereas only 12% of the cows which carried calves to term were copper deficient. These results indicate a relationship between copper deficiency and the ability of a cow to drop a calf on the ground, which is likely one of your top priorities as a rancher. The next two slides are summarized from the same study, which used 120 cows to look at the impacts of copper deficiency on multiple aspects of reproduction. The authors of the study designed it so all of the cows on trial were on a copper deficient diet. However, half of the animals received an injection of copper sulfate in order to maintain sufficient copper status, whereas the control group was forced into copper deficiency due to the diet they were consuming and a lack of that copper injection. These animals were then placed in a reproductive focus study. The results indicated that animals which were treated with an injection of copper sulfate or the copper sufficient group had an 85% conception rate, whereas those cows in the control group or the copper deficient group had a 36% conception rate. Now I'm guessing when you heard me say a 36% conception rate, you got a little concerned or maybe your eyes bulged a bit. Frankly, it is unacceptable and not profitable to have conception rates that low for a cow-calf operation. The goal is a 100% conception rate in your cow herd, because we all know an open cow is a cow that isn't earning her place in the herd, and it's just simply an expense. In the same study I just discussed on the previous slide, they also observed the impact of copper deficiency on a cow's ability to display estrus or express heat. Only 60% of the copper deficient cows presented estrus, while 83% of the copper injected group or copper sufficient cows expressed interest. So not only did the group forced into copper deficiency have more open cows, but they weren't even successful at presenting estrus and showing signs of heat. This function is another often overlooked, but yet still very vital aspect of a successful and productive cow herd. In summary, copper is linked to a cow's ability to express estrus and therefore gain the interest of the bull, conception rates, and calving rates and the ability of a cow to carry the calf to term. If you have a cow-calf operation, these three aspects of reproduction are the drivers of your operation and dictate your ability to make a profit off of your herd. 
Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and discuss the relationship between copper and immunity. This is one that has been established for decades, with research done on mice, rats, pigs, and cattle. For a rancher, once that calf is on the ground, the next goal is to ultimately get the calf shipped off, placed into a grass finish program, or sold through some other venue, such as shipping to the mainland. The goal is to do this with the least amount of inputs possible in order to have a greater net profit off of each calf. Proper immune function can significantly affect this. In this group, there were two groups of calves, a copper sufficient group and a copper deficient group. Both groups were exposed to infectious bovine rhinotracheitis virus, or IBRV, which is one of the viral components of the bovine respiratory or bovine respiratory disease, or BRD, complex. The calves that were copper sufficient had greater serum titers. Titers are the goal of a vaccine. When we expose an animal to a pathogen through a vaccine, we want as many titers present in the blood after this exposure so that when they're exposed to the pathogen again in the future, in real life, an IBRV will always be one that calves are exposed to, especially on the feedlot end, they will be better equipped to fight off the disease. These results indicate that copper sufficient calves will be less likely to be impacted by an IBRV immune challenge in the future compared to their copper deficient counterparts. In this same paper, researchers again had a group of copper sufficient and deficient calves. However, instead of IBRV, these calves were exposed to Mannheimia hemolytica, a big player in the BRD complex, and is the major bacterial pathogen which causes bovine respiratory disease. Again, calves which are, were copper sufficient had greater serum titers after this immune challenge, indicating a greater ability to handle any future Mannheimia hemolytica challenges in the future. In the top right of this slide, I put a chart which is summarized from USDA APHIS data, which indicates the greatest treatment cost for a feedlot is bovine respiratory disease at $23.60. A survey of ranchers last year from the mainland indicated on average $26 was spent per calf treating respiratory disease. I can imagine with the increased cost of labor and medication that this number is much higher for Hawaii. Now, if we can decrease the need to round up and treat calves for things such as BRD by simply having adequate mineral nutrition, then that would mean more money in your pockets at the end of the day on a per calf basis. In summary, copper deficiency can impact the initial immune response, the e efficacy or how good your vaccines work, future immune responses, and then I didn't really touch on this, but it has also been linked to immune cell regulation and how well the inflammatory response is. So now that I've given you a reason for why copper is important, let's transition into some of the nutritional aspects of copper and how that plays a role in the beef cow nutrition. When we discuss copper deficiency, there are two types of deficiencies. A primary copper deficiency, which is caused from insufficient copper in the diet, which would be anything less than 10 parts per million, and a secondary copper deficiency, which is caused from antagonists present in the diet, which limit the ability of the animal to absorb the copper provided to it. That means that the cattle may be actually consuming 10 or more parts per million of copper in their diet. However, they're not able to absorb and therefore utilize that copper, and it is essentially excreted or pooped out and unused. In the case of copper, these antagonists are sulfur, iron, and molybdenum. And unfortunately for livestock producers in Hawaii, all three of these minerals are an issue in the state. As a ruminant nutritionist, I always like to poke a little bit of fun at monogastric nutritionists or nutritionists for pigs and chickens because animals like poultry and pigs are pretty cut and dry. But when it comes to ruminants, such as cattle, what goes in isn't what is necessarily absorbed and made available to the animal. There is a lot of modification and interactions and complex processes that occur in the rumen, both good and bad. As I mentioned before, copper and iron have an interesting relationship. Their relationship differs if we are referring to their interactions in the blood versus interactions in the gut. 
Copper-containing enzymes facilitate the transfer of iron and iron metabolism in the blood, and extreme copper deficiency can result in anemia. However, in the rumen or in the gut, high levels of iron can have a negative impact on copper absorption. Iron levels over 200 parts per million can limit copper absorption. The specific mechanisms for how this happens are still being explored, but some ways it impacts copper availability is by directly binding to copper, breaking it apart from sulfur if it is in the form of ferrous sulfide, which I know is a little bit too chemistry-ish, and the sulfur binds to copper, or it can compete for absorption sites and therefore can kick the copper out of the place where it would be absorbed by the rumen and small intestine. Sulfur and molybdenum work together to bind up copper. Molybdenum alone doesn't greatly impact copper availability, but molybdenum and sulfur together form thiomolybdates, which are copper hungry. These compounds seek out copper and bind to it. Once this happens, the copper literally cannot be absorbed and is excreted in the feces. Sulfur on its own can also bind directly to copper and form an insoluble or unabsorbable form of copper and is unabsorbed and excreted. This graphic illustrates everything I just talked about in a more visual way. What happens is the animal consumes feed or supplements containing various minerals, such as, let's say, sulfur, iron, molybdenum, and copper for the purpose of this presentation. Those minerals are often bound to an inorganic compound, such as sulfates, in the case of copper sulfate or ferrous sulfide, and they quickly dissociate or they break apart in the rumen. In the case of copper, this allows it to carry a charge and attract things such as iron, sulfur, or thiomolybdates, which are the sulfur molybdenum compounds that I mentioned in the previous slide. Once they are bound, they are near impossible to break apart, and the copper simply passes out of the rumen, goes through the small intestine where it can't be absorbed, and is essentially excreted out of the body into the manure, as you can see in the picture. You have likely seen this chart before in past extension presentations, but I really wanted to reiterate it here. As we can see, based on this data, iron, molybdenum, and sulfur all have an ideal concentration in the diet, and they're therefore required and always needed. However, if it reaches levels greater than those listed here, it can impact copper absorption. For iron, that's anything greater than 200 parts per million. Molybdenum would be anything greater than one part per million, and for sulfur, anything greater than 0.2% of the diet from a dry matter basis. Again, this is a slide that you've likely seen before of Hawaii's forages, and it's a lot of information. But you can see here that Hawaii's forages contain extremely high levels of iron, well above the antagonistic level. And depending on the season, both molybdenum and sulfur flirt with or are at that antagonistic level. From this data, we can see that during a majority of the year, iron levels are well above the 200 part per million cutoff for antagonism. All three of these are a perfect storm or a recipe for disaster when it comes to supplementing copper to your herd. So what does that mean for you as a producer? How can you make sure your herd is copper sufficient in light of the fact that your forages seem to be fighting you from every angle? The single most important thing you can do is to know the nutrient profile of your feedstuffs or your forages. At a minimum, forages should be sampled annually and a full panel of analyses should be done, which includes NDF, ADF, protein, etc., as well as all macro and micro minerals. Let me repeat that, all. Keep in mind that simply knowing how much copper that's in your forages is not sufficient because we just talked about the fact that we have antagonists present in our forages. Ideally, I'd like to see forage samples collected and tested seasonally. We can then see from the data on our forages that mineral content is heavily influenced by season and we suspect mostly by rainfall. 
by being able to collect and test forages seasonally for a year or two years, we can get a pretty good idea of how your forages are going to perform year after year. If you ever need to be trained on forage testing or have any questions about where to send it, what to have analyzed, how to collect it, or anything else, do not hesitate to contact either your Extension County agent or an Extension specialist, and any of us would be more than willing to assist you with it. After you've had your forage tested, next is developing a supplementation strategy. One size does not fit all. So it's important to try and tailor your supplementation for your pastures. And I know that that's easier said than done. Please keep in mind that salt alone is not sufficient in order to have a nutritionally balanced diet for your herd. I do want to take a moment to have a brief discussion on inorganic versus organic minerals because I know it's kind of a hot topic in the nutrition and just general livestock world. Now, by organic, I don't mean USDA certified organic. I'm talking about minerals that are combined with an organic compound, such as an amino acid. Organic minerals include chelates, proteinates, polysaccharide complexes, and amino acid complexes. Inorganic minerals are the commonly known minerals, such as the sulfates, chlorides, and oxides. So, what's the big deal about organic minerals, other than the fact that they're obviously more expensive? Well, they have a completely different chemical makeup than inorganic minerals. Organic minerals are more tightly bound, meaning that when they enter into the GI tract or into that rumen, they dissociate or break up to a lesser degree in the rumen versus something like copper sulfate, which is almost always 100% separated in the rumen. This means that oftentimes the organic copper can pass through the rumen without binding to any of the antagonists and a greater amount of the copper is able to be absorbed. These products are again often more expensive than inorganic minerals and they might not work for every operation or may not even be needed if there is little to no antagonist in your forages. I highly highly recommend penciling out the use of these minerals and weighing out the inputs and outputs of their use, maybe even using some sort of risk assessment tool. With that, I just want to say a big thank you for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedules to listen to me nerd out a little bit about copper. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the Livestock Extension Group virtual field day presentations. We have a lot of great information to share. And again, if you have any questions whatsoever regarding minerals or nutrition, feel free to reach out to me or to any of your county-based extension agents or a, a extension specialist and we would love to help you out and of course i had to show some videos of the favorite cows i've worked with in my past thank you guys <laughs>